Bible, turn to Galatians 6 and verse 1. Galatians chapter number 6 and verse 1. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. The divine text says, verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let, let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Father, I pray now, Lord, that you'd anoint this holy word, the divine word, the living word of the living God, as it goes forth today, Father, from the mouth of this messenger. I pray you'd bless it, and I pray you'd give me unction and anointing to preach it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians covers a lot of ground. He simply starts in the first chapter of the book of Galatians talking about how that he had been given authority from God to preach his word. He was certainly an apostle called to preach God's word. And then he talks about how that he had to confront the apostle Peter, chapter number 2, because Peter was vacillating a little bit and allowing the Judaizers to draw him back away from the grace of God, which is in the gospel of grace. Then he told the Galatians in chapter number 3, he said, you're foolish. You started in the spirit, and he said, now you're letting the Judaizers come in, and now you're going to be justified by the works of the flesh. Not going to happen, he said. In the fourth chapter of the book of Galatians, he uses an analogy of Abraham and Hagar and Sarah and the, and, and the promise that God gave when he gave the birth of Isaac through the promise and he connects that with salvation because salvation is not of works because he said, Abraham by works bore a child to Hagar. That doesn't work. He said, Abraham by faith bore a child through Sarah. And that child was the child of the promise. That, he said, is how we all get saved is by simply believing and trusting God. In the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, he uses the well-known terminology, verse 16, to walk in the spirit. You'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then he enumerates the works of the flesh in verse number 19. And he tells you what they are. He says they're adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then in chapter number 6, apparently, he's talking about someone who has fallen into the works of the flesh. For he says, if a brother be overtaken in a fault. So it, to me, in my thinking, I would say that the Apostle Paul, having warned them about the works of the flesh and the power of the flesh and the power of the old man, says in verse number 1 of chapter number 6, if a man be overtaken, the word translated overtaken is the Greek word prolambano. That word literally means to snatch. Lombano is a strong Greek term. It means to reach out and take. And so prolombano means that something has come upon him swiftly with no warning. So he says if a man be overtaken, that's what overtaken means. All of a sudden, out of the clear blue, a man or a woman does something that is unbelievable. That some, their friends and their neighbors would say, I can't believe that so-and-so would do such a thing. Have you ever heard that before? Amen. That is not the person that I know. But the bottom line is that most of the time, there are two of you. And the one that comes in here on Sunday morning is the one that is for public consumption. But the one that lives throughout the week is a battle with the one who comes in here on Sunday. 
and the old man wrestles and fights against the new man. And if you're born again today, you fully understand that doctrine. You will agree with the Apostle Paul when he says that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And the Apostle Paul says, in my flesh, he said, I put no confidence in the flesh. And then, of course, he defines the flesh over and over and over again. So we need to understand that if a brother is overtaken in a fault, note carefully, this is not a professing believer. This is not a heretic. This is a brother that is overtaken in a fault. Then ye which are spiritual to restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Now lest you say this morning when I preach that and bother me, I don't worry about that. That'll never happen to me. Be very careful. Because down through the few years that I've been pastoring a church, I live, folks, I live in such a position that I observe the lives of many people. And I have seen people down through the years do things that I never thought I would ever see happen. Yet it happened. And they have wound up in terrible straits because of what they have done. So this message this morning may be a warning and an encouragement to you because you need to understand, let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed. You need to take heed lest you fall. We can fall. We certainly can fall. Notice carefully, when your faith becomes shipwreck is the title of this message this morning. When faith becomes shipwreck. A pastor of one of the largest churches in America has gone to prison for sex with an underage girl. A youth pastor goes to prison for sexually molesting children. This just happened. An investment guru pastor goes to prison for absconding with millions of dollars or at least hundreds of thousands from his parishioners. A pastor goes to prison for stealing tens of thousands of dollars from the church offering. This I learned about while I was on vacation just a few days ago. This happened down there in the area that I was. That, that I was. A longtime pastor is charged with sexually molesting children that he had done for decades. And then the church leadership covered up what had been done. That is not unusual. Churches cover up many times the things that are done because they don't want shame and reproach to be brought to the name of Christ. Let me tell you something. The Lord doesn't need you to straighten up the problems. God doesn't need you to cleanse the sin. He doesn't need you to try to figure out what has to be done when a sinner sins. That was taken care of 2,000 years ago at the cross at Calvary. The blood covenant of Christ the Lord will cleanse the sinner. And the spiritual Christian, the mature Christian, the Christian that is ready will be the one that helps restore such an one to the spirit of meekness. What is a spiritual Christian? He's a discerning Christian. What's a discerning Christian? Some people you cannot help. What does that mean, preacher? Everybody in this house today probably has a besetting sin that you need to stay away from. Do you agree with me? There are certain places you don't need to go. Now, there are people in those places that need help, but you are not the one to help them. Do you understand that? There's an awful lot of people that will never understand that concept. They think that they can just go anywhere and they please and minister any way they choose. But that's not the way God works. The Apostle Paul said that a door would be opened for me. My friend, let me warn you today. You know where you're weak. You know the weaknesses of your flesh, at least you should. And you need to understand there are circumstances and situations you need to stay away from. That is a discerning Christian. A mature Christian understands the Christian life. What is maturity, preacher? It's learning that even though God saved you and wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life, even though you know that you're a new person in Christ Jesus, that old man is still there. 
that old man is still there. And if you feed him, and if you allow him, he will dominate your life again. And I'll tell you something, folks. A mature Christian will never, ever, ever give in to that old man and think that he'll make excuses for that old man. I had a man say one time, he said, now, preacher, he said, I do things that aren't good. I do things that aren't right. He said, but it's really not me doing it. He said, it's the old man. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? Well, that's what he said. And therefore, he justified his life. He justified some of the things we're doing by simply saying there's two of me. Yes, there is. And the old man is the one doing it and not the new man. Well, I'm going to tell you what Paul said. Paul said that if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. He said, if you sow to the flesh, ye shall of the flesh reap corruption. So you can spin it any way you please, make excuses for it, but it's not going to change the fact that there is an accountable day coming, an accountability. A spiritual Christian is a humble Christian. What's a humble Christian? You know how weak you really are. Some of you in this past week or this past month had dreams that would embarrass you to death if there was a big screen up here in front of this church showing everybody the dreams you had. How many understand that? Just to let everybody know in here today, we don't have any big shot spiritual Christians. Have you figured that out yet? We don't have a Sanhedrin here at Temple. Everybody's on the same level. I like it like that. I like the cross with level ground. No difference in your color or the money you got in the bank or how well you're known or what all you've accomplished in life. This is not a big shot church. This is a church with sinners in it that got saved and that know that there's a battle raging to live for Christ. Amen. So you need to understand that a humble Christian is a spiritual Christian and you know how weak you really are. And some of you understand that and some of you have yet to learn it. Some of you feel like that you've progressed possibly. You've reached a state of sanctification. There are those out there that believe that. That where this old stuff doesn't bother you anymore. Well, I will tell you, I've been saved since 1973. And I'll tell you right now, some of the stuff that comes back into my mind that sometimes I dream about embarrasses me. And I'll get up and say, Lord, that's not me. And the Lord says, I know it's not, son. You've got a brain. And that brain is the battleground. That's where you came. That's what it's about. And that brain Satan can use. And so can evil spirits. So therefore you must learn to walk in the spirit. You must learn the fruit of the spirit is wrought in you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And when you are consciously aware of your life and your surroundings, it's the kind of life you choose to live that defines who you are, not what you're dreaming at night. Amen. Amen. A spiritual Christian is a gracious Christian. What does that mean? That means that the fruit of the Spirit flows from your soul. And that the grace that has been ministered to you when God reached into the darkness that you were living in and saved you that... Listen, i got to get this. Somehow I've got to get this across. God did not bring you out of darkness to save you. God saved you where you were. Then he brought you out. The fact, the fact that you're born again is in itself a separation that takes place. You are not what you used to be. You're in a foreign town, a foreign country, among foreign people. The moment you're born again, you know that there's something different between you and them. That is grace. For grace reached down to where you belong and pulled you out. Why don't you give the same grace to each other? Why don't you have patience with each other? Why don't you pray for each other? Why don't you bear one another's burdens? The Bible says esteeming others greater than self. It's not about ourselves. <laughs> You'd be amazed at the people that have fallen into swimming pools and walked in front of cars taking selfies. This terrible generation for selfies. 
They're coming out with all kinds of stuff now where you can put an arm on your camera, your, your smartphone, and hold it out here and take a selfie. I marvel at all the people who want a selfie. The two things that I despise. Two things. I hate them like you wouldn't believe. So what are they, preacher? Uh, scale and mirror. <laughs> despise both of them. Got no use for either one. Amen. I hate scales. <laughs> Every one of them's a liar. And the mirror, got no use for a mirror. Amen. Amen. <laughs> a spiritual Christian is a spirit-filled Christian. What's that mean? Let me tell you what a spirit-filled Christian, to my understanding, is. It's somebody with an insatiable hunger for God. They figured it out. It's not about the church. It's not about anything around. It's not about the preacher. It's not about your life. It's not about what you have. It's not about who you are. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a spiritual Christian with an insatiable that means that you cannot be satisfied until you have the fullness of Almighty God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible says to restore such an one. The Greek word translated restore is kartazitso. Kartazitso. So what does that mean, preacher? It means to adjust, fit, finish, complete. The fundamental, fundamental meaning is to establish, set up, equip, arrange, prepare, mend. So what do you mean, preacher? It means that if you're mature enough in the faith of Christ and you see a brother or a sister fall or see them taken in a fault, you don't gloat over it. You don't gloat. God doesn't gloat. You don't gloat. Do you get any satisfaction from watching somebody begin to slip and slide and go backward instead of forward? You don't gloat. You get, you're grieved. You're bothered with it. You want to pray for them. You want to reach out to them. And if you have the maturity God gives you as a mature saint of God, you will know their place in the church and in the body of Christ. Busy work is just that, busy work. We're all called to do something in this house. Everyone makes his election and calling sure. Everybody's not called to preach the word of God. Everybody's not called to teach a Sunday school class. Everybody's not called to stand on the street corner and preach. Everybody's not called to do the same thing. But we have a calling. And if you have maturity in your soul, you will encourage that Christian and help them in that calling wherewith they're called. In other words, that's fitting them back. You'll pray for them. You'll pray with them. And you'll be there as an encouragement to them. We have people that are coming into the church today, folks, that are being saved today that are literally coming out of hell. A culture that is in hell. And they're coming out of it. We have people that are coming in the house of God today that are being saved that have absolutely no knowledge of the Word of God and of God. None, folks. None. Zero. And yet they're full of God, they're full of hope, they're full, of, they're full of, of, of the energy of the Lord. And they want to come in and do something to serve God. Sometimes they'll stumble, sometimes they'll mess up, sometimes they head the wrong, wrong way. But that's for you to gently encourage them to get back in the right way. Now I just read this. This was on the news. It's been all over the internet. You've probably read it if you do much research at all on the internet. Here's what it says. It says, a woman walks into a bar while breastfeeding her child and tries to prostitute herself in exchange for free drinks. A former pastor, get this now, a former pastor and his wife were recently arrested at a bar after his wife brought her baby into the bar while breastfeeding her and began to offer herself for sex in exchange for drinks, according to a report. Now just digest that for a moment. I mean, just, just think about what I just read to you. This man was a former pastor of a church, senior pastor of a church. Now he and his wife have gone into a bar and they go in there and she wants to sell herself to get drinks. Man, they've come a long way, wouldn't you say? I mean, they have fallen a long, long way. How did they get there? 
Well, here's some things I jotted down. What happened to this pastor? Maybe he was treated wrong by his church. Maybe his wife was unfaithful and he got mad at God. Maybe they had a child die and they carried a little casket like that out to the graveyard. Maybe they had financial problems and couldn't pay their bills. And they got mad at God again because he didn't supply every need they had according to his riches and glory, they thought. Maybe he was wrongly accused in his church. And accusations and charges were brought against him. And it broke his heart because he saw the people turn on him. And he knew he'd given his life. Maybe he yielded to temptation and committed adultery. Maybe he was never born again to begin with. And when he started pastoring a church, he was way over his head. This is just a few of the scenarios I jotted down. This is just a few of the things that could happen to any of us or anybody. I'm not his judge. And I take no pleasure. I do not gloat in what this... I can imagine one day, let's say 35 or 40 years ago, that I went with my wife and we went to a bar. And we walked into that bar and I knew my wife was trying to sell herself and prostitute her body just to get a drink. And I think to within myself, good night. There was a time when I stood in the pulpit and I preached the word of God. How far have I come? There may be somebody out there right now listening to me. You may be listening to me right here in this place. You stood in the pulpit one time and you preached the word of God. And now where are you? We say, you're mocking me, preacher. No, I'm not mocking you. I'm trying to help you. These two people right here, before I ever got up here in this pulpit and mentioned, I'm not mentioning names. I'm not going to do that. I don't need that. But before I ever got up here to preach about this, I prayed for both of them. You better believe it. I poured my heart out to God for both of them. I thought, they, I thought to myself, that could be me. That could be my wife. That could be me. You say, when I preach or something like that could never happen to me. No, say that. You don't know what you would do in some circumstances faced with some of the temptations and trials that people are faced with. There's a man on the internet who used to pastor church after church after church. I read some of his resume. He'd been here, he'd been there, he'd been here, he'd been there, been four, five, six, and seven different places. He pastored, associate pastor, youth pastor, did, all, did it all. Now he's an atheist. Now he's an atheist. And I always like to read their reasoning. Why don't you go to church? Why don't you love God anymore? What happened to you? So I read the list. Well, let me tell you something. If you find fault in the church house, I don't have a problem with that. You find fault in another preacher, it doesn't bother me. You find fault in your religion, no big deal. You find fault, you think in the Bible, mistranslations or conf conflict or this or that. I can understand where some people are coming from if you haven't really studied. That really doesn't bother me. But you know what bothered me? It really got a hold of my soul. It shot through me like a bolt of lightning when I read this one. He said, and that criminal Jesus. I thought, oh, ho. That begins to open up the real soul, that criminal Jesus, that criminal. Did you know I've talked to men so drunk they couldn't stand up? I've talked to people who have been caught in the very act. I've caught people in every situation, talked to them that you can think of, but I've never had one of them yet. Not even Pontius Pilate could find fault in him. There's just something about it. There's just something about it. It just gets to the soul. There's something about it. I've never found fault in the Lord Jesus Christ. i found fault in everything but Him. He's perfect. Pure, holy, undefiled. Who can convince me of sin, He said. If you want a mark of the spirit that's in you that animates your soul, that you live by and for, it's what you think of Christ. He said to his disciples, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? 
All of them. All of them. Even Judas Iscariot. When he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And he went back and he threw it down at their feet. And he said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. My goodness. I would say to this man, I would say, sir, you say yourself, you say you're an atheist and you've pastored churches. You've been here, you've been there, you've done this, you've done that. I would ask you to go back to square one. I would ask you to go back to the beginning of all of your religious experience, back to where it all started. And I would ask you to start at first base. What do you think of Christ? What do you really think of Christ? Born again believers. Don't talk like that. These two need prayer. If you want to come up here after the service this morning, and you want to see their faces and the information that I have here about them, it's easy to run this, run this on the internet. They're both together. Here they are. And I noticed something about this. I did a little deeper research into it. It's all over the web. And most of the articles about it on the web, pastor, pastor, big letters, pastor and wife, seldom said, believe this, a secular newspaper up there close to where this happened didn't mention one time that he was an ex-pastor. Not one time, and they knew it. That secular newspaper gave more consideration to these two than all of the all of the Christian religious sites. You see, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that that secular news site simply said, man and his wife tries to prostitute herself to buy drinks and carries a baby into the bar, breastfeeding that child, and that's all it said. It didn't say one word about him being a former pastor. Think about that for a minute. That newspaper was not gloating in the fact that he was a former pastor. He that is spiritual restores such an one in the spirit of meekness. The word of God's a powerful thing. It's very powerful. If you believe the word of God, it will begin to work in you and it'll do something that'll change your life completely. Amen. Amen. Now I get testimonies all the time through the mail. This is one of the most remarkable testimonies I've read in a long time. This is quite a testimony. I want to read it for you this morning. This girl wrote me. She lives up in next to Boston, Massachusetts, up New England area. She wrote me and wanted me to have her testimony. And then she said, Preacher, you can use that if you want to. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention her name, but I am going to read her testimony for you this morning. There's power in this word. Here's what she says. She says, I was living deeply in sin. I was a lesbian, a drunkard, smoked pot, disrespected my mother, was filled with murderous and lustful thoughts, and was angry and hateful. I had such a, I had such a terrible attitude. It would even, I would even curse God when I was angry and unwilling to see the blessings around me. After I got saved by our blessed king, I noticed that before I was so numb, so dead, I couldn't empathize, so broken, that I didn't care about anybody but myself as a type of defense mechanism. Pastor, I couldn't even shed a tear anymore. A tear of true spiritual conviction was not drawn. I remember the key words you said that struck the fear of the Lord in my heart. My words were, if you're not saved right now, I'd run down here, I'd run. Well, preacher, when I was struck with that fear, I could sense the demons, beings that were around me. There were so many, it's unreal. I knew that it, if, I were, if I would die without God, I'd burn. And while I was, while I was, uh, while I was surrounded by these beings, I tasted hell. I could feel it all around my soul. The demons were attacking me like a gang of savages, accusing me left and right, telling me I was doomed. I was trembling and shaking for weeks. They were trying to keep me from understanding God's mercy and that he loves me and, and holds me dear as a father does for his daughter. 
Here's what I'm going to try, I'm trying to say to you about what she said. When the Holy Spirit began to convict me, that's when the real battle started. That's when Satan fought for my soul like he never had before. He, she said, I experienced demonic power against me like I never had before. She said, I was a lesbian. Now listen to what she says. Preacher, can you ask God if it's okay for you to warn the homosexuals? They need to know that they were not born that way and that they are conditioned to think so. Preacher, it's not easy to convert. It took me three years to finally understand that it is a battle of the carnal mind. Oh boy, would that help somebody. It took me three years, she said, to understand that it was a battle of the carnal mind. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. I'm going to tell you something, and I don't want to say it to you to make you feel bad, but I'm going to tell you the truth. That flesh will never quit trying to dominate your life as long as breath is in your body. You will reap from that flesh what you did when before you got saved. Your memory banks will be refreshed time and time again by Satan. And you'll say to yourself, how could I think this and still be saved? But when you come back to the Lord Jesus Christ and plead the blood of Christ and tell him he's yours and you're his and you're my father and I'm your son, you'll get that sure assurance from him that I'm not what I used to be, Paul said, and such were some of you. But you've been washed, he said. You've been cleansed in the blood of Christ. You've got to remember this battle will forever rage. Don't give in to it. Years, she said. Three years she fought it. She was so deep into it. Three years. But listen to this now. You can see the sweetness coming from her. She says, I suffer now, preacher. She's asking me to pray for her. She says, preacher, I suffer from nicotine addiction and really need help. I get dreams that I don't want and the evil one keeps attacking my faith. When this happens, I always say, I'm not giving up on Jesus. I'll never give up. But I fear that it could be worse. She's already learned that the key to her victory will come in Jesus. Y'all you know, follow me? She has already learned that it is who he is to us, how we can appropriate him to our lives, how much we love him. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He's my Redeemer. He's my Deliverer. He's the one who makes me free. He's the one who opens the doors. He's the one that keeps me. He's my God. Once we understand that, then we begin to understand the key to victory, the key to the Christian life. The key to the Christian life is not trying to live right. The key to the, the, key to the Christian life is Christ. He's my Lord. And He's my God. That is the key to the Christian life. He's the manna from heaven. He's the Holy Spirit power in my soul. He's my Lord and my God and my Redeemer. You cannot separate a Christian from Christ. And once you do that, it becomes intellectual Christianity, which is junk garbage. Now let me give you another perspective and I'll close. This is unusual, but it's the kind of thing that'll help you. I won't tell you who this young lady is. If I told you who she was, you'd know who her daddy was. And I'm not up here today to run anybody down. I'm up here this morning preaching principles, concepts, scripture. A daughter speaks. Listen to this daughter. Listen to her. When I was in my mid-twenties, I remember sitting in that huge auditorium one Sunday morning and carefully observing the people in the congregation. The looks in their eyes scared me. As I mentioned in a recent article, you looked like zombies. Sounds extreme, but in that moment as I looked around, it was extreme. 
It had gone beyond just intently listening to your pastor. It had gone beyond merely ingesting a sermon. It had crossed over into complete worship of your pastor. You were spellbound. You were in awe. You were mesmerized. Not by scripture. Not by God. Not by biblical teaching. But by a man. And if that man falls, you fall. They are good Christians. They love the Lord. Do anything, give you the shirt off of their back. But they are so tied up with a man. You don't understand how shaky your Christian life is. Every man, including this man, can fall. Every man, including this man, can fall. Every last one of us can fall. So if your faith and your life, your love and your joy and your peace is built on a man, you are on shifting sand. That's why I constantly remind you, I'm a messenger. I'm a messenger. That's all I am. I'm a messenger. I'm a messenger. That's all I am. The message that I give to you is the truth. It is the foundation of our faith. The Christ that I preach to you is your Lord and Master, not me. A man can fall. Don't put your faith in a man. Respect him. Honor him. The Bible says that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. You shall not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The pastor is worthy of double honor. All of these things are biblically true. But when it comes to your trust and faith of your soul for salvation, your walk with God, don't put your faith in a man. Put it in the Lord. And sometimes you wonder, and I've seen it happen down through the years, how all of a sudden out of the clear, such and such a pastor is gone. They're dead. They're dead. They're finished. God took them from this earth. It's over. They're gone. And I'm not the judge. I'll leave that to the judge. There's only one capable of that kind of judgment. I'll leave that to him. But I crawl in my closet. And I get in there and I say, Lord, thank you. Yeah, I'm honored to be a messenger just to preach your word. I told him this morning how honored I was just to be able to stand up and preach his word. But folks, that's all I am. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray you'd bless your word as it goes forth now. Those folk that have gathered in this house, may Christ, may the Lord Jesus, may the Son of the living God bless his righteous name. May he be the focal point, the object of our affection, the one that we worship. May we lift up the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his holy, righteous, blessed, sweet name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. And amen. Let's stand up here this morning.